Hi, this is Misha, and this is a rifle we have uh, shown you a time or two before. This is the HKG36, assembled from an original rifle by Michael's Machines. And as promised, we were going to do a history video and kind of talk a little more in depth. And now seems like as good a time as any. Now, if you're interested specifically in this semi-auto legal version, uh, check out our video on that. This is more of the history, because this gun does have an interesting run. Going back to West Germany, as you know, they used the G3, beginning in 1959. It's design really kind of goes back to World War II, but I don't want to go back that far today, but you get the idea. HK obtained full licensing for the G3 and then made a whole family around it. They intended to do the HK32 and 762-39. Well, that never really took off. They did the HK33 in 5.56 NATO. That actually did well. They put it into major production, but it was never adopted by Germany, but it was adopted by other militaries and police forces, including Malaysia, for example. It seemed like it was very popular in, uh, in East Asia. And of course, there was the 9mm version, the MP5, and the whole family went on. And then in the 70s and 80s, it was kind of briefly considered that Germany might go to the HK 33 but it wasn't really seen as of enough of a step forward because they had the g3 really the only advantage to going to the 33 was the new 5.56 caliber instead of going one step forward they thought to jump ahead and make a leap forward with what became known as the g11 in the 1980s and hk worked on the g11 for a long time a lot of time and money and energy G11 was a caseless rifle. It fired a 4.7 millimeter bullet and was really futuristic for the 80s. It had some issues. They were trying to work them out. The high cyclic rate um, kind of had some, some things to be worked over. Also cleaning and all that. They were working on this when in 1989 the wall fell and then soon, thanks to efforts from Ambassador Spock, West and East Germany reunified. And then in 1991, the Soviet Union fell apart. So basically overnight, the major threat disappeared. And West Germany now had East Germany to consider, which was not nearly as economically uh, viable after so many decades of communism. So it had a financial burden and it no longer had a major reason. So funding to the Bundeswehr was cut. Along with the G11. It was officially canceled in 1991 and therefore all of HK's investment was gone. And HK ended up in really bad financial straits. In fact, this is why British Aerospace would purchase them and how HK would get involved with the L85 Enfield, the SA80. That's a story for another day. Trying to kind of salvage what they could, HK tried talking to the Bundeswehr into going a route where they would go and purchase a few thousand G11s for issue for frontline troops and then buy the G41 for second line troops. And the G41 
was nothing more than an HK33 updated to take AR-15 magazines. Also, it had a bolt hold open device. So basically, they said, hey, why don't you buy some slightly updated 33s and hey, take some of these G11s we've been working on for over a decade. Bundeswehr said thanks, but no thanks. They didn't want to have two calibers in the supply chain and they really just didn't have the money. Well, the next year, HK came back and said, hey, if you don't want to do that, how about you just adopt the G41? Bundeswehr very briefly considered this, but quickly rejected the idea because it wasn't seen as enough of a step forward. They went from the idea of the G11, which we'll call it two steps forward, to the G41, which was not even probably a, a full step forward from what they had in the G3, because it was still a roller delayed system, same optics mounting style. The only real advantage again would be going to 556 five, NATO. So they rejected it. This left HK in a bit of a pickle. In 1992, the Bundeswehr kind of released its requirements for the new rifle because the G3 was aging and now we have to re-equip East German soldiers as well. They were using the MPI KM and MPI M74, which were AK derivatives, so they had to you know, get something more modern in you know, one single caliber. So what they set out and asked manufacturers to deliver was a a rifle cheaper faster more economical to produce than the g3 or other older guns two a rifle that was lighter weight more compact and preferably made from modern polymers the polymers would help with both the weight and the cost three the rifle needed to be modular so it could be kind of reconfigured for different roles, anything from a light machine gun to a DMR to an infantry rifle to a carbine to even a submachine gun sized thing. Next, they wanted it to be ambidextrous. This is kind of a change in Germany. Before this time, they really wanted all lefties to learn how to shoot right-handed. Finally, they realized that lefties weren't the spawn of the devil, I guess, and so they said, okay, can you make it ambidextrous? And they said it needs to be more controllable in full auto than the G3. Now this was kind of a roundabout way or de facto way of saying chamber it for 5.56 NATO because anything larger gets hard to control in full auto, especially for a lighter weight gun. Later, they would also add hey, make it more of a standard format, standard rifle format, meaning basically no bullpups. They wanted a stock, a grip, magazine, you know, barrel. HK would begin the HK-50 program that year, and that's where the G-36 here finally comes into play. They would continue to work on this, and it would go into field trials in 95, Really, there weren't a lot of guns it was put up against. It was tested against the Steyr AUG, the Steyr AUG, a few other things, but really, it was the only game in town. And it had been designed specifically to meet the needs of the Bundeswehr, so it was kind of a shoe-in. They would test it in different environments, different fields, and then in 1997, they would officially adopt it as the G36. HK would change its own internal nomenclature from HK-50 to G-36 as well. The initial order from the Bundeswehr was for 33,000 guns with an option to purchase another 17,000, which they would take the following year. So their initial order was essentially for 50,000 guns. So what do we have here? Alrighty. This is a little cover. This is a Bundeswehr issue cover that protects the optic. Let's start at the muzzle, shall we? We have a pretty typical HK flash hider, but it has wrench flats now. It is on the kind of the splines that most HKs will be. The barrel is a quite a lightweight barrel. It's about 18 inches. So about the same length as a G3. 
It's chambered for 5.56 NATO with a 1 in 7 twist, cold hammer forge, chrome lined. Pretty standard there. The bayonet lug is interesting though. This is why I brought out an AK bayonet. Sorry guys, this is Russian. I couldn't put hands immediately on my East German bayonet. But what they did, because East Germany had so many leftover bayonets, they basically took an AK bayonet, they cut off the small ring and attached a 22 millimeter NATO ring. So the lug on the rifle will take an AK, but then the ring going around the flash hider is 22 millimeters, so it can launch standard NATO rifle grenades. We also have the grenade ring back here. I don't have one of those bayonets. I kind of plan on making one because buying originals gets really expensive. But I thought I'd bring out the AK just to show you. They basically just modified AK bayonets in the beginning. Later they would purpose build. We'll get into disassembly in a minute. We have a handguard here that's free floated. This is a short stroke gas piston system. There are many handguard types. This is kind of the basic original. Later they would introduce rails. Notice there's no sights here. For our sight, we have this carry handle system. This is also highly modular. It's held on by three screws and then it's kind of in a dovetail. This is the polymer one with backup iron sights on top. This is the so-called single power optic. This is mostly on the export guns. It is either a 1.5 or a 3 power scope built into the carry handle. Now the German military originally would have the so-called dual optic which had a red dot on top. It was battery powered. It was a ZF red dot sight. It's pretty modern for the mid 90s when it was developed but by today's standards it's very antiquated. Also quite heavy by today's standards. That's why this one just has the single power. But it would look just like this with a little hump on top. That's why this cover has a little extra space. We have a folding stock. And this is a good time as any to mention this. Basically with the G36, instead of having a revolutionary design like the G11, they went to an evolutionary design, borrowing what they thought were the best features from rifles of the day. This, for example, the folding stock mechanism is quite similar to that seen on the Swiss SG-50, STG W90. It locks in here to this brass deflector, has a port you can eject through so you can fire it with the stock folded in the military. The magazine is also very much like the Swiss mag. Translucent polymer, holds 30 rounds. It's kind of a semi rock in. It's mostly straight in, but it has a little bit of rock to it. The paddle mag release is very Swiss or AK style there. In fact, those mags can be coupled together. That's why I brought this out for you. Where did I put it, guys? There it is. Here are two put together. Boop. The pouches. This is more or less an export pouch. It holds two. It has standard loops in the back. This is more of a German military. It holds one. And it has the kind of attachment you would expect to see on the German field gear post-Cold War. Get my bayonet out of here, guys. This is a no pretty much all polymer gun. Obviously, the, metal, the barrel is metal, but handguard is polymer. Receiver is polymer with metal where it needs to be. The original carry handle is polymer. Stock is polymer. The grip housing is polymer. Polymer, polymer, polymer. Makes it very lightweight. They also went to the ambidextrous features. The lower has the selector on either side. That's going to be in the way, isn't it? Oh well. 
So that's ambi. Pistol grip doesn't have um, grooves. The charging handle is probably one of the most famous parts of this gun. Most because it's kind of fun to play with. It's like a fidget spinner. It can be rotated to either side and then returns, as you see, to the center. It does have a bolt hole open, as you see. Also, this can be locked to either side to use as a silent closure or forward assist mechanism. There is no external release, so you have to take a mag out or put a fresh one in and then let it go forward. This does reciprocate, but it's also safely out of the way. It's not going to knock your fingers. There is also a manual hold open control inside the trigger guard there. So you can lock it back for safety or cleaning, whatever you need. Obviously the mag catch being a paddle is also ambi. The stock only folds to the right, but you know. And there's only an ejection port on the right, but it does have the brass deflector, which keeps the brass out of the face of a left-handed shooter. So they, they achieved the ambidextrous part. They also achieved the weight and size requirements and the modular requirements we're about to get into. The standard G36 military rifle with the dual optic, which had a, had a lot of weight, was about eight pounds, which sounds heavy, but take off the dual optic and go to a single optic and we're about seven and a quarter pounds, so we lose three-fourths of a pound just getting the red dot off. And if we want to go to a more modern rail, we'll get below seven pounds. We're about six and a half to six and three quarters without the optic. So we're getting pretty light, honestly, for a 18 inch barrel riffle. For the modular system, they did several barrel lengths. Pretty much launched with the rifle was the G36K Carabiner that had a 12 and a half inch barrel, so quite a bit shorter. It also had an open-ended kind of four prong flat shutter, which four prongs work real well on short barreled, especially 223s. Had a slightly shorter gas system, shorter handguard, and originally it would also have the dual optic or for export known as the G36KE. It would have the single power and it would be a little bit lighter looking at about seven to seven and a half pounds with different optics or about six and a half with out just kind of a rail on top. Then they would introduce the G36C, which was the submachine gun size version or commando version. It came out a little bit later, around 2000. It had a really short barrel, about nine inches. Originally, it was mostly issued with iron sights only, but of course, because of the modular upper, you could put whatever on it. And it was a pretty light little critter, about six pounds and a quarter. They would eventually come out with different stocks. For example, the C, which this actually has a C stock on it because I'm short. The C stock was a little bit shorter than the regular G36 and G36K stock, but we're talking less than an inch. Same pattern though. They would then do a foldable adjustable version as an option. And they would go from there. The, you know, you'll see a lot. You get the G36E, later it would become the G36V, and then you go to the G36KV, and so on and so forth. There was also a light machine gun version called the MG36, which was basically the same as this rifle, but it had a slightly longer and heavier barrel. It was about eight and a half pounds, so really not a whole lot different. And the only thing you really had to do, the receivers were the same on all of these. It was just removing the barrel, which HK had. It's not quick removable, but if you have the right tools, it does come off very easily. And speaking of coming off, let's take this that guy apart and look at some more features and parts. I'm going to remove my sling. Like I said, these went into service in mid to late 97 in... Germany. If 
by 98, 99, they started to see some pretty heavy use and were in there in pretty large numbers. And in 99, they saw their first actual combat in the hands of Germans in Kosovo, in the UN peacekeeping action. Also, Spain, who honestly had really just about a decade earlier went to the Set Me L in 556, adopted the G36E, which is pretty much exactly this version here with the single, or the one and a half power optic and all that. And we even produce, a, uh, excuse me, purchase a license to produce it at the Santa Barbara factory. And then a short time later, Saudi Arabia would buy some G36s and also start to produce some. And both, actually all three countries still issue this rifle today. After that, about 30 other nations would purchase G36s, at least in some quantity. The Ks and the Cs were especially popular. These also became very popular with uh, law enforcement because it's a very simple, lightweight, it's very rugged in the sense that there's not much to rust, there's not a lot of controls to get in the way, and it is very reliable. HK claims it can go 15,000 rounds without major cleaning, and they've got several rifles at the factory that have gone well beyond that. So reliability is, uh, is pretty much tops on this thing. And that has a lot to do with the operating system. So these were early on in the late 90s, early 2000s, pretty darn successful. So how do we take this guy apart and what's under the hood? Well, we have typical HK pushpins. They are very much like you usually see, but they're a little bit long and skinny compared to normal. Where's my other one? One here. And as you see, there's a nice little place to store them in the stock. That's where we begin. To disassemble, we just fold the stock over. The stock is nice and tight, which is a good thing. We just can remove the trigger housing here. Let's look at it and then we'll move on. It's pretty typical HK. The trigger group is actually pretty simple. Nice big hammer. Very light. Because it's so modular, that means you can install different trigger packs, trigger housings very easily. Very HK trait. They offer them in single fire and semi only versions for police. They also offer it in burst modes, different ones. The magwell is also modular. All you have to do, this one front push pin holds it in. You press in your mag catch and it rotates forward on this little block here. Just a little plastic magwell. That's neat because they do make a version that a magwell adapter that goes on to take AR-15 magwells. Like it's using mags. To get our guts out, there is this in the back. You just press down, pull it out. Kind of angles out. This is our recoil spring. You see it's a single spring. There's a buffer underneath and a polymer block. Further. Take our bolt out. This one likes to stick at the end. I'm not sure why on this one here, but I'll get it out. There we go. They usually don't stick like that. I mean, there's probably a burr in there. Here is our bolt group. It's all one unit. If you notice, this is very AR-18 style. Multi-lug, the cams on the side. We have a floating firing pin. Simple, effective, very big, very blocky, but it honestly isn't that heavy. And that's really most of your weight. Now that we've taken that out, our receiver is just a shell. Polymer, it has metal reinforcing in the guide areas. There's also a reinforcement up here where the bolt recoils. There's a reinforcement back here plate where the recoil plate goes, but that's pretty much it. This optic, as I said, does come off with three screws and then it just slides off, but I'm not gonna do it on camera because it's zeroed in. 
our gas system is equally easy to get to. Let me flip it around here. Got a single push pin here. That can be going, that can be stored in the stock, but it's just easier right now. This slides forward as a single unit. So this is your typical polymer handguard, but they make all kinds as you would expect. Here's our barrel and here's our gas system. To take apart our gas system further, we just separate these two. As you would see on most of your standard AR-18 styles, it's that kind of, it's a modified gas piston system, but based on the AR-18. This is also the same gas piston you'll find in guns like the HKE-416. And that's it, that's our gun field stripped. Like I said, they don't really need a whole lot of cleaning or maintenance. They are pretty solid and dependable. They're simple. And the Bundeswehr has purchased, over the last 20 years, about 170,000. And as I said, many other militaries have also used these, especially the shorter versions. In fact, the U.S. looked into a version of the G36 beginning around 2002 known as the XM8 it was basically a come on get that boat lined up guys the XM8 was basically a G36K it had a 12 and a half do it this way this is the easiest way let's go easy huh we go. It's a lot better when gravity is on your side. <laughs> the XM8 was a uh, G36K with a 12 and a half inch barrel and actually they did even more to um, try and lighten it up. They got it six pounds and uh, it was actually in trials for a good number of years until about 2005. It performed very well at least in durability trials. However, especially considering the fact that they did all they could to lighten it up, it did prove to like to melt its handguards. And this is an issue that was known for every G36. So in 2000, actually HK introduced heat shields for the free-floated handguards, and these became basically de facto standard. They were always intended for the light machine gun, but they ended up being put on most rifles in the 21st century. So you would hope that these would serve, looking for my magwell, there it is, hello magwell. And they did serve well in the beginning. But then as Germany sent troops into places like Afghanistan and then soon Iraq, they had overheating issues. And I don't think I'm going to go too much into that in this video because it's really a topic all on itself that reported and real and potential and all the issues about the G36. But... So I think I'll do a separate video really getting into the, the, the truth and the kind of the fiction. But I have to at least mention them, right? I mean, gotta be fair. I did that again. I did that on the other video too. I always put that front pin in for some goofy reason. I think it's just habit. Sorry guys. Anyway, um, they had some problems with them overheating, especially in the, the deserts. And HK reminded of a couple of things. One, this was a gun meant to be as lightweight and as polymer as possible. And it was designed for use in Germany, which is not particularly a desert. And it was meant to be used mostly on sing a single shot as a rifle. The full auto was really only there for emergencies and other situations like that. Get this lined up here, guys. Come on. That combined with the heat shield handguards seemed to do the trick, at least for a while. 
There we go. You got to line up the back piece with the bottom and the receiver, so it's actually going through five different things. But then more issues started to surface in 2010 and really had been reported on to this very day. Mostly to do with overheating and the consequences from it. Accuracy, they say that when, um, when it gets hot, it loses accuracy because the, while the barrel is screwed into a steel trunnion, that trunnion in turn is set into the polymer receiver because obviously when you have a polymer receiver at some point it has to take over you can't be metal all the time otherwise it'd just be a metal gun so they were having problems with the mounting of the trunnion in the receiver and they were saying it was losing accuracy they also started to claim that the tests were kind of rigged in hk's favor in the 90s which, yeah, anyway, they definitely didn't have a lot of participants, but then again, the Bundeswehr had a lot of weird requirements. And so, in recent years, there's been a lot of talk of replacing this guy in German Bundeswehr service. And in fact, beginning last year and running through this year, 2018, trials are ongoing, but they're not actually scheduled to end until May of 2019 but the winner you know announced that summer so we're still about a year off from a potential replacement being announced for this gun and the first guns of the new type whatever it might be aren't scheduled to start hitting the field in any numbers at all until at least 2020 so it's very clear this gun will be in service for probably at least another decade as it gets phased out Right now, there's a design from Rheinmetall Steyr, kind of a joint project that's in the running. Looks pretty neat. There's also another HK, the HK-433. And they're even, at least on, they, they say, considering the SIG MCX. That would be interesting, to say the least. So we won't know for a while what actually replaces this, and this will remain in the military for some time to come. Like I said, I think for a video on potential problems with the G36, we'll do a second part. That seems better, because getting tired of talking, you're probably getting tired of listening to me. And this was on the history of the gun. Most of the stuff is kind of a he said, she said thing when it comes to the potential issues. Boop. Triggers on these aren't actually bad at all for a military gun and a polymer trigger at that. Well, I hope you enjoyed this look at the, the gun. I think it's a neat gun. It's a unique design. To me, it kind of reminds me if you went back to, say, James Cameron in the 80s with the movie Aliens, telling him, hey, design a futuristic gun. Kind of, this looks like someone took the M16 of the day, molded it in plastic, and tried to make it more modern with the scope and everything. It seems like a, a yeah like a modern M16 in the guise of 1980s think, so it's kind of retro. And it's just these I love shooting these. They shoot really smooth. They're not the best in any way, shape, or form, but they're very smooth. They're very nice. They're just fun for as light as they are. I don't know. And of course, you have HK reliability. And these are reliable, and in semi-auto. You don't have to worry about the overheating issue. And this is why a lot of police departments still like these. They're not really shooting them in full auto. This is a gun they can throw in the trunk, not worry about, and pull it out if and when needed. Also, because of its modular design, they can set it up for whatever officer needs it. And since it is ambidextrous, left or right hand doesn't matter. Folding stock means it's very compact, and if they need it even smaller, they can always buy a K or a C. Or if they buy, say, an E like this, and then decide they want a K or a C, all they need is to send it to an HK armor who can pop the barrel out in five minutes and put in a new one. So it's yeah, it's very configurable, which is very attractive to police. They always are on a budget, of course. <laughs> And it's just a shame we don't really see more of these. In 1999, HK did introduce the SL8 series, starting with the Dash 1, 
which was a civilian version in single shot. The European versions of the SL-8 still took standard G36 mags, but were still kind of sporterized. The versions we got over here took proprietary 10 round mags. They had a very different back end. They had a fixed thumbhole stock. They did have a target trigger, which was nice. They usually came with just a rail, a short, simple rail on the top. They had a longer barrel. It was about 20 inches, and it was much heavier. And of course, it did not have a bayonet lug or a flash hider or anything like that. And a lot of people, including myself in the past, converted these SL-8s, but the conversion was very arduous and took a lot, especially to do it right, to make it look right. It wasn't a simple thing, unfortunately. The SL-8 stopped coming into the country about 2010, 2011, and then places like CDNN were selling off old stock as late as 2012. There was talk of bringing in the HK293, which was an updated modern G36 semi that was supposed to be closer to original. But these, although they showed them at SHOT Show a few years back, are never coming in. Right after they kind of talked about the 293, all the polymer issues came up and all the scuttlebutt. And I think HK just wanted to distance themselves completely from the G36 design. In Europe, they did get the 243, which is pretty cool. It's a very modern gun, though. So Europe tends to get some of the cooler HK stuff compared to us in the U.S. Look at the MR223A1, for example. So there aren't a lot of semis available. This is why the Michaels machine is interesting. This is an original G36 reworked to be semi-auto. For exactly how that happened, you can check out our initial video. This is patterned off kind of an early Bundeswehr gun. In more recent years, they have used, at least in some numbers, what they call the G36A2, which is a modernized version. What they did, they got rid of the dual optic. They went to a rail, short rail, with a reflex sight on it. They went to a metal handguard with rails. And they actually replaced the original long stock, the G36 336K stock, with the C stock, for better use with body armor and thick clothing. And of course, because of the modular design, updating original guns to the A2 was easy peasy. So it kind of came in use and it kind of gave the gun an additional lifespan. Well, that's about as much as I can ramble about this gun, as much as I do think it is cool. And we're gonna have other videos. If you haven't seen our older ones on this, you might check those out. And if you have, you might check back soon when we have more kind of range videos and comparison videos and so on and so forth. If you like the video, please click like. If you'd like to help support the channel, we'd appreciate if you'd check out our Patreon page. As always, this is Misha, and we'll catch you next time.